So uh, we're gonna do a little interview here. So I want you guys, if this, the, my, my guest by the way, he was uh, a writer as the frugal traveler on the New York Times for a very long time. He has a column there now where he helps people uh, you know, with different travel problems. He's a professor at NYU. He has a big YouTube channel uh, called Amigo Gringo, I think is right, that's correct. I'm a, I say that because uh, it is Brazilian. It is, he speaks Portuguese, he speaks some Spanish. An incredible guy, super nice, super smart. You guys are gonna love him. Please welcome to the stage, Seth Kugel, everybody. Keep it going for Seth, huh? Keep it going for Seth. <laughs> Oldest trick in the book, you have people keep it going when you have to do something. <laughs> That's a hosting 101. How you doing, Seth? I'm good, I noticed you called me nice. Yeah, he's nice. It's not like the best compliment ever. Okay, he's a real mean guy. <laughs> he's mean. Kind of say that about people you don't want to date. Uh, she's nice. <laughs> Are you speaking from experience right now, Seth, huh? <laughs> He's like, this is the last time I get called nice. Damn it. <laughs> no, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for thanks, being here. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, nice. Crowd. You see that? He's saying nice, too. <laughs> uh, they would like to be called something other than nice, like cool. Right? Spectacular Spectacular, crowd. there we go. So, uh, okay, cool. So let's just get started, get right into this. First question. So I, I, you know, I like to chat and get to know people. You know, this isn't, this isn't, this ain't your grandma's interview, <laughs> you know? Okay, great. Anyways, <laughs> here's the first question. We'll get started, get right into it. Uh, how are you? <laughs> uh, I am doing great. I just made a little recovery from some brain surgery, and this is my Look first public appearance. That's right. <laughs> Look at that. I, I, to be frank, I don't make that many public appearances, so <laughs> it's, but yes, wow. I'm feeling good. You're feeling good. Yep. Doctor's orders. Come, cut, do that show. Do that show. The people need you. You're here. This is great. Well, welcome. So, so you have traveled all over the world. I, I, I thought it was interesting uh, just talking to you just now that one of your pet peeves is people who count the countries they've been to. You've been to so many, yeah. I imagine. I wasn't going to yeah. ask you how many. You know, uh, uh, a gentleman never tells. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Um, yeah. Why is it? Why is it a problem? Why do you? What is it about it that you do not like about counting countries? Well, I think it doesn't really tell you very much. Yeah. If you've, uh, for example, when I was uh, uh, younger, I went to Kenya, and then we got to the border of Uganda, and they had closed the border for some reason. But I'm like, can I just step over the border for a second? And I did, and I stepped back, and that counts as a country. What does that even tell you? Uh, and the people I dislike the most in the travel writing world are the people who say, I'm going to visit every country in the world. And there's like, you know, depending on how you count, like 180 or 200 countries. And then they make a point of spending like one or two days in each one of 180 countries and don't get to know any of them, leaving a massive carbon footprint in their wake. I would much rather, to me, you're a better traveler if you spent six months in France, six months in Brazil, and six months in China than if you spent a year and a half going to 180 countries. I think you're right. I think, yeah, yeah, this is true, right? I mean, you think about it. I remember once I did, a, I was on a trip and we were in Andorra. We went to Andorra <laughs> and this guy. We I were, wouldn't spend six months in Andorra. No, no. no. Well, we actually have the Andorran ambassador here, everybody. Give it up for her. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no. Um, but no, th so I, we were actually in Andorra and we were taking the bus to leave Andorra and one of the people in our group uh, made the bus driver stop so he could get off the bus and have his passport stamped which you probably don't need. It's probably an open border to go from France or Spain into Andorra. Is yeah, right? but you get your passport. You do get a passport stamp. And he did. He made everyone in this bus stop so he could get a stamp on his passport. And I think that person uh, is what you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's cool that you've been to Andorra and Liechtenstein and stuff yeah. like that. But I just don't know if Liechtenstein and Andorra should count as two, whereas like Russia and China count as two. Sure. It doesn't sure. seem fair. Yeah. Okay, so this is a so as someone who lives in New York, who spends so much time in New York, yeah. who you know you teach at NYU, you teach journalism at NYU, how has traveling as much as you have given you a different perspective on this city? Um, it's because if you really love traveling, and then you come home to New York, you can continue traveling within New York. I mean, I live in Queens. Uh, just today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I didn't grow up there, 16 years in Queens. And um, just today I met some friends came out, a family of, of friends of mine, and we had a Tibetan food, 
and then we walked down the block to get a mango lassi at an Indian place, and then we work, walked further down the block to get a Colombian pastry, and that's all in the same block, and yeah. that's in my neighborhood. And those are not fancy places meant for tourists coming into Manhattan. These are places where Tibetans and Colombians and Indians are eating, and to me, just being in Jackson Heights, which is my neighborhood, is like traveling. It's, uh, you know, just to walk to the train, to the subway, it's an eight minute walk. If I don't hear six languages, and if I don't see people dressed everywhere from very formal, all covering um, Muslim women, covering most of their bodies, to like, I, were there some Colombians here? Yeah. To, to like some Colombian women who in the summer are covering not enough of their bodies. <laughs> on the same walk, then, you know, to me, that's great. That's what I get out of travel, is to be exposed. I'm the kind of person that travels for people, to meet people and cultures. I know some people very legitimately go to see beautiful mountains and go hiking and national parks, and I love all that, too. But for me, really, it's to just see how much, like, the wealth of culture there is in the world and to realize how little we know about other people's cultures. And in New York, you can just do the exact same thing. Yeah, no, you're right. I think you're traveling. Whenever I've traveled, I uh, I definitely uh, come back with a definitely appreciation of not just New York even, but the United States even. Sure. The United States is such a new country, and it was basically it's been this crazy little experiment. Of people all over the world, and you do you want to learn not only more about the mountains and the beaches of this country, but also the people who are from all over the world. And Jackson Heights, by the way, if you guys have never been to Jackson Heights, boy, you're you're missing out. It's, a, it's the most diverse place, arguably, in the world. It was a, they say 167 languages are spoken in Jackson Heights. This is a neighborhood that's the size of half of Central Park. It's insane. Like, that's, that's insane. Like, you can't, you can't even make that up, you know? And, and you can just go to the subway stop, Roosevelt yeah. Avenue, Jackson Heights, and get off and, and walk in yeah. five blocks in every direction and see, like, restaurants of 60 different countries. Yeah. Not that we're counting countries. Right, exactly. Now we're... <laughs> Forget counting, lose it, lose that skill. But no, there, there's a little Pakistan next to a little India, then there's a little Colombia, there's all, all within one subway stop. It's so it was with my, my friend was yeah. from Brazil and, and they are raising a kid here in New York and the kid is three years old and has never been to Brazil. And, and I said, oh, let's go, let's go show her the jackfruit, and, which is this massive fruit if you know what it is. And my friend was like, yeah, I gotta show her jackfruit because we have that in Brazil too. So we, I, we took, we went to the Bangladeshi store selling big jackfruits so that my Brazilian friend could show her daughter what a jackfruit looks like. That's a New York story for you. That's pretty cool, man. That's, and that's Jackson Heights. I don't know if you saw, uh, not to... Not to that's why they call it Jackson Heights, by the way, because of the jackfruit. Is that, yeah, is that right? <laughs> Although, funny, funny you should mention the name. Jackson Heights was actually named Jackson Heights. They named it Heights, even though it's not elevated, just to get people to move out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, wanted, they were copying Brooklyn Heights at the time. Isn't that ridiculous? That's, that's so funny. That's true, yeah. That's, so, that's amazing. You know, that's New York for you, huh? Just looking for any reason to raise the rent. <laughs> Just name it Heights. Uh, okay, I, I, you know, one of the things that I guess with your writing and, and the stuff that you cover that, that jumps out to me that I, that I identify with is your, I guess, um, your focus and your, you talk, you emphasize the idea of wandering. The idea of getting lost, the idea of not using Google Maps, the idea of getting away from technology as much as you can can you explain why, why you, you feel that way? Sure. I mean, this is kind of what I call uh, organic travel, and I compare it with organic food. Like, organic food is what we used to just call food, right? <laughs> and, and it's just like what, the way you used to make food. Well, the way people used to travel before smartphones, and I love my smartphone, but the way people used to travel is with paper maps and getting lost and not quite knowing. And my mom, who would, went to Europe in the 60s or, or 70s, just said, yeah, we just got off the train at some place and just asked people what to do. Yeah. Or we went to the information desk and looked at the postcards to decide what we're going to do. And so you had a lot more getting lost. Uh, you had a lot more surprises. And even with restaurants, I think people go to restaurants now based on what, where it's ranked in TripAdvisor or Yelp or, or just Googling something. And you decide what you're going to eat even before you get to the restaurant. You're like, oh, this place is famous for this, so we got to have this. Right. And then once you get there, nothing's a surprise because you've read 18 reviews right. of it. Uh, and then it better live up to your expectations. I sort of think like if you went to the same restaurant, if you read 60 or six reviews of it online, or if you read zero reviews and had no idea what it was gonna be, you could have the same meal and it would taste better if you hadn't read any of the reviews. 
Yeah, because you build expectations. It's surprising. Yeah, it's, you, you oh, also whoa, think I've never heard yeah. of this before, as yeah. opposed to like, oh, I heard the truffles here are marvelous right. or something like right. that. Right. Well, that's also, I think, part of the reason why there's lines around the block at certain places now, as opposed to five years ago. Now you're just inundated TikTok, you know, uh, you know, Instagram, all this stuff is telling you to eat at the same places. Right. So you go to Katz's Deli, you can't get into Katz's Deli anymore. Right. You can't right. get into Russ and Daughters, you can't get into, you know, at Prince Street Pete's. All these places have lines around the door, and, and I think that's kind of part of it, no? Yeah, um, that's yeah. it, and, and, and it, places get ruined. Now, places have been ruined forever. It used to be that if you were in Lonely Planet, right. your place was ruined because it got filled with tourists. Now it's, but it's, now it's more intense. Now it's anywhere. If it's on Google, it has a million reviews. It, and there's ways, of course, people play around with the algorithms and, and cheat it and all that kind of stuff. So I just believe that you don't need to just completely arrive somewhere and have no idea what to do. But you do need to like save a day or save an afternoon of the week you're in Buenos Aires or whatever and just wander or just pick a neighborhood. One thing I like to do is look at a map or have someone help me like, that lives there and say, where are there no tourist attractions? And they'll say, oh, it's this neighborhood here. And they're like, okay, I'm going there for the afternoon. And then you just walk around. And quite often, not always, but quite often, that will be the best day of your trip. And I also found that when, when things go wrong in your travel, like you thought you made a reservation, but you didn't, so the place is full, so you have to wander down the street, that becomes the best meal of the trip because you just wandered into a place. And I think part of that is the fun of travel. Yeah, um, no, that's great. I think that's also best case scenario if you go, because you go up to someone in other countries and be like, where's the one place there aren't any tourists? I feel like they'd turn to their friend and be like, hey, this guy wants to get robbed. <laughs> <laughs> you should take him. I will say, some, some people like to say, like, well, ask the locals where right. to eat. But really what the locals are going to do is tell you where they think tourists want to right. eat. Yeah. So you have to be a little more clever in that's the kind true. of questions you ask. Like, I will actually say, where do you, where's the last place you took your family to eat? And then I'll, I'll even say something like, look, if I see any other tourists in this place, I'm coming back and I'm going to find you. <laughs> this place you're recommending better have no tourists, because people do think they know what tourists want. And if you're the kind of tourist that doesn't want what other tourists want, you have to be very specific about the way you ask those questions. Okay, well that brings up, uh, I guess that begs the question, what is a good, how, do you, how are you a good tourist? How do you become a good traveler and tourist then? Uh, there's a, there's, they, I can't define that because then I become, I, whatever I say becomes like sort of the elitist way right. to travel. You'll get canceled. It, <laughs> no, it's because there's a million ways to be a tourist. I think that what every tourist should do is be a little bit more spontaneous, be a little bit less planned, et cetera, than they already are. So if you're the kind of tourist that literally plans every day and every minute, that's the kind of person that you are, that's okay. But do do that one afternoon of wandering. If you're the kind of person that plans a little bit and not too much, plan even a little bit less or be a little bit more daring than you otherwise would. Sometimes I think people are scared when they travel for the wrong reasons. So people will say, well, I'm not going in there because it might be dangerous. But what they really mean is I'm not going in there because I'm scared to talk to people I don't know. Like, or I don't speak the language and I'm worried about what's gonna happen. And they sort of claim that they're scared because it might be dangerous. Really, it's, they feel uncomfortable. And I think if you're not ever feeling uncomfortable when you're traveling, then, then you're not traveling correctly. That's right, that's true, yeah, no, that's good. That's right. I think that's a good motto for life, just feeling uncomfortable, you know. That's pretty enough. You, should wanna, you wanna put yourself in an uncomfortable situation? I mean, obviously there's a limit to that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You're gonna be a complete asshole, I guess. But uh, but no, that's true. You put yourself in uncomfortable situations. That's you. That's your body signaling to you. And you're in a new place, in a new situation, and that's where that's where growth happens, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the right. more you know, dee 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 dee. You know. Um, uh, okay. So you uh, there was. Uh, I've also uh, noticed that you say that you said before that um, the most interesting things happen when you travel, when you don't plan. When you're going off the beaten path, when you're when you're not on an itinerary, what's the most, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you on your travels? Um, I mean, there could be a million answers to that. I one of my favorite trips ever was I spent two weeks in China, mm -hmm. and China is anyone from China here? Huh? I mean, it's a very culturally different place. And usually, when people travel, they go with groups or they at least go with someone who speaks the language. And I went with none of that, and I took a bunch of ferry boats up the Yangtze River. And I think spending time uh, on these overnight ferry boats 
on the Yangtze were quite an, an eye-opener. Just to give one quick story, I got on one of these boats and I was going to stay overnight and they give you a little cabin key and a room and I didn't speak any Mandarin and I'm using Google Translate and they're like, go to this room and I go in and there's like a family of eight people <laughs> and there's only two bunk beds. I'm like, there's some mistake here. And so I go back and I put in Google Translate into my, and we're on a moving boat. Uh, and I give them, and it's just a room full. And then the woman's like, come, come with me. Comes with me, opens the door, starts screaming at like two in the morning. And this whole family starts moving around. And they all get on beds, like two people on each bunk bed. They leave one completely unmade, already slept in bed for me. And she's like, that's your bed. <laughs> And it just goes to show that, you know, and I, I don't really care. Like, I'm not the kind of person that I'll sleep in a bed with dirty sheets, I guess. I mean, you got to be flexible. But there are certain people I know who would not like that situation. Mm. And it's that sort of thing when you just realize, all right, this is what we're going to do. And then I spent the next day using Google Translate and trying to talk to these folks. And, of course, they were the greatest family of all time and gave me their food and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I guess... That's an example of something nice. kind of crazy. Nice. I just, I love to think that that family was just like, this, this American guy just came into our cabin. Just give him all our food. Just give him all our food. Yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> they're like, oh, that's great. Okay, no, whatever. Just were, please. They, just, just, okay, great. They're, and they're, they're just like. Real, <laughs> I had a Mandarin phrase book with me too, so I would like try to count to 10. And right. the kids thought it was hilarious. Right. Because, you know, they always tell you the tones are different. So when you say horse, you really are saying like, you know, my, your mother stinks or something like that. Right. And so who knows what I was saying just by counting to 10. Right. But it was, it was, it was super fun. It was a great, it was a really great experience. And of course, the people on that boat, most of them had probably never met a foreigner because it's not a boat that rich people take. The rich people take the bullet trains and the planes. You're taking one of these ferry boats, you're not always exposed to foreigners. And you do usually find, I do have another, like my number one rule of travel is that if you go where there aren't any other tourists, the people there want to meet you as much as you want to meet them. As opposed to you go to a place where there's a lot of tourists uh, then people would just see you as a way to make money. Mm -hmm. So I would rather go to a place, even if it didn't have the greatest attractions, just being on that boat, everyone wants to meet you. You're a total celebrity. Yeah. Um, I, oh, I'll just, I'll get one more story from this boat. Sure. Well, this, we so, gotta get on this boat, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a crazy boat. The weird thing about this boat, uh, uh, and, and cultural differences, cultural right. differences, it was all covered in rugs, much like this rug, mm -hmm. covered with sunflower seed shells. And they just nice. go around spitting out sunflower seed shells all over the place. But it's a just a cultural difference. That's <laughs> all it is. Who knows what they thought of me and my, my habits. So um, I'm on the deck, and I'm talking to a kid. And now we're really using Google Translate. By the way, if you've ever seen someone type in, in Chinese on a smartphone, you got to If you have friends who speak Chinese, watch how they yeah. do it. It is unbelievable. I'm not even going to tell you. You just got to ask someone. Um, so we're typing away, and he's like, do can I see a dollar bill? And I'm realizing, okay, the kid's never seen an actual dollar. And I have my bag here on the deck. So I'm like, okay, I think I have a dollar in the bag. So I go down and I open the bag up. And I realize right away, everyone else on the deck has rushed over and is staring into my bag. <laughs> and it's just a question of what personal space is. I had already kind of realized that personal space is, you always realize it's different in every country. Mm. Like, I'm this far from you. If, we're in a, if we were in China, I'd probably just be sitting here and you'd be <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, but it was just so interesting to see, like, they don't care. It's not rude at all for them to look in my dirty underwear. Uh, and so, I thought it was great. I thought it was hilarious. So you were like, oh, I'll show you a dollar. Here's my dirty underwear. <laughs> right. Nice but, prank. And prank we all the have kid. these incredible stereotypes about yeah. China, especially. Now China's in the news all the time. Sure. And uh, it's just so great to have been there and to have had these weird experiences, but also to have these very warm experiences yeah. like I did with that family for a day just to sort of dispel... Um, not to completely dispel stereotypes, because some of them end up, you're like, oh, yeah, that is kind of true. But just to get the negativity of those stereotypes out of the way. Yeah, and get the bigger picture, you know, is that you put flesh on the bones of what you do know of a country. I think that's great. Uh, okay, so, so, um, so here is a, a quick question, I guess, because, because you have such an unorthodox, I guess, career path. I think it's, such, it's so interesting. I mean, you, you, said, you, you said in the past you grew, you grew up traveling, 
but you're a, you know you're a professor. You have a you, you learn these languages. You have a YouTube channel in, that you that makes you famous in Brazil. Like you you uh, you were the frugal traveler. You're a writer. All these different things. How did you end up where you are today? Like I guess that's one of the beautiful things about New York is it's a place where you can find these unorthodox career paths where you can kind of make a a, a a path or a trail for yourself. How would you say you ended up where you are today? Uh, I can tell you exactly. Uh, in 1998, I was working for the uh, City of New York Department of Youth and Community Development under Mayor Giuliani mm -hmm. uh, in the Bronx. And I had done a lot of work in the Bronx and especially working with Dominican communities up there. And the Dominican? <laughs> Who's Dominican? Uh, Yato Sari. And... Uh, and uh, I just was complaining to my friend uh, about my job working for the city. And she said, why don't you just try to take a class? You're a good writer, right? Because she remembered me from school, writing for like the school paper. So I just looked up a class and it turned out to be called Writing for New York City Newspapers and Magazines. It was offered at the new school, uh, taught by a woman who still teaches it to this day and is very famous in the New York City writing world for starting people's careers named Sue Shapiro. Took the class. She just gives you these assignments, and uh, they're assignments that are designed to get you published. It's what, what these publications are looking for. And I had uh, three stories bought from that very first class. One was bought by the New York Times, uh, one was bought by Time Out New York, and one was bought by Playboy. Ah. And the Playboy one was a personal essay, and then they never, they never <laughs> I'm published it. I'm sure it was, Seth. <laughs> they never published it. I'm very happy they That's never good. published it. I got paid. And I was already in the New York Times in That's time That's amazing. Out. All from the first so, time. So yeah. then basically you just start freelance writing. And yeah. to be honest, the second answer to your question is if you're a journalist, it opens up the world to you, mm -hmm. right? You meet tons of people. You get to travel a lot if you do it the right way. So I ended up moving to Brazil because I wanted to be a foreign correspondent for a little while. And then all these things start happening. You make friends in Brazil and then your friend in Brazil starts a company in 2013 where he's trying to create quality YouTube channels. And he's like, wait, I know. What about my friend Seth, who moved back to New York, and the Brazilians love New York, let's get him to do a YouTube channel in Portuguese about New York. And he hired me to do it, and he paid for it for two years, and then the Brazilian real currency collapsed, and he didn't pay for it anymore, so now I do it myself. Yeah, I mean, that's, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. One of the opportunities you have in New York, I mean, all of us here, you have the, anyone here tomorrow could sign up for a class. I always tell people to just sign up for classes. Like, you have, not only do you have opportunity to take classes in New York with doing all these things, but from the best people in the world, right. teaching them. I mean, it's incredible. Like, I, I started comedy as a class. I took a class, a stand-up comedy class. <laughs> that's how I started years ago, and I, and I was terrified. It took me three hours to hit enter to sign up for that class. Literally three hours. I walked around. I had like I had a drink. I couldn't do it. I was so nervous. And then I did, and it changed my life. You know, like that's the kind of thing that in New York, that's right there for everyone to do if they really wanted it. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, we got we got to keep moving. Here we go. It's time for the rapid fire questions, Seth. I uh, I don't know if you know this, but I have a little graphic. There you go. We have to set our <laughs> set the set our faces on fire. There. That's pretty cool. Rabbit. Oh, there your face on fire too. Oh, where are you? Reminds me of my surgery. <laughs> yeah, I hope that you're really trauma. You're traumatized. Okay, here we go. Let's let's do this. We're gonna we're gonna wrap. We're gonna we're gonna go quick here. Rapid fire, baby. Okay, if there was one neighborhood in New York that you could show a visitor, what would it be? Jackson Heights. Jackson Heights. Okay, that's Jackson Heights. Everyone here's like, I'm gonna buy property in Jackson Heights, <laughs> and then everyone who lives there is gonna be like, damn it, why did we go to that show? Uh, okay, what's the coolest thing that's ever happened to you in New York? Is this supposed to be fast answer? Um, <laughs> or the craziest, I, I, craziest I, had, I had brunch. Uh, it was at the table next to Seinfeld. That was pretty cool. That is kind of cool. Which, by the way, the Westway Diner over next to Manhattan Plaza is where him and Larry David concocted the idea for Seinfeld. I don't know if you guys knew that. Over on 42nd. Uh, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> and I also had lunch next. Uh, Nathan Lane was at a table. Sure. Uh, it's just like sitting at a restaurant near a famous person. That's yeah. just overall the coolest thing. Yeah, lots of famous people in New York. That's for sure. You definitely run into lots of famous this people. Guy? Look at this guy. He's yeah, famous. really. I mean, yeah. Look at that. That's right. Um, yeah, actually, I, I ran. I saw Cameron Diaz once at, at the, in the park, and I remember this was like when she was at her, at her, at her peak, and I was everywhere, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. And, and people were like walking by, like taking pictures and stuff, like sneaking pictures and everything. I went up to her, I was like, hey, if you want, I could like tell these people to leave and stuff. It's totally cool. <laughs> um, we ended up dating for six months. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Okay, what's the what's the best concert you've ever been to? The best concert of yeah. my of my whole life? Yeah. Uh, well, probably my first ever concert, Cure, nineteen eighty six, something like that, in the Worcester Centrum in Massachusetts. Wow. But I'm also with the Dominicans. I I I, I love seeing Juan Luis Guerra, if you know him. Sure, yeah. In uh, that's right. His Ma his is the show after ours, actually. <laughs> I I just saw him. I see him every time he comes to Madison Square Garden. He puts on a great show. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's great. Okay, so what is, what's your least favorite thing about New York? Oh, um, 99 cent pizza? Whoa. Now, you were saying you didn't want to sound elitist. <laughs> but I mean... I got to stop you right there, buddy. That 99 cent pizza is better than all the pizza in Tampa, Florida, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's okay, ever been right. made. Um, okay, I'll, I'll change my answer then. Uh, it's the, the subway delays on weekends. Drives me nuts. Yeah, that's true. I live in Queens, right? So the E and the F are my lifeline. They're expressed. The third stop is Manhattan, except on weekends when it's like the 17th stop. Usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty rough. The train. We're all beholden to the trains. You know what? At the same time, the subway is what makes makes New York. Unfortunately, that's a, that's the tough thing about it. Is the well, love, I, love I, hate. And I really do think that re, like it's getting a little bit better now. But I think for a while people really. I did think, like, I gotta spend less time in New York because this train is driving me crazy. Yeah. Uh, especially from Queens to Manhattan. I think inside of Manhattan, it continues to work better. But, like, from the outer boroughs to Manhattan, it's just it's getting a little intolerable. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, it is bad, but, uh, you know, I, I'm living up Which the is same. why I hear you're paying for my Uber home tonight. That's right. That's <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm actually I'm going to be pulling a rickshaw with you in it. Actually, <laughs> uh, pedicab is what we're going to be doing. Um, okay. And what's a, what's a, uh, what is your one I guess uh, piece of advice for anyone I guess who just moved to New York? Got some people who just moved to New York. What would be your piece of advice for how to take advantage of the city? What to do? What do you want people to leave with here? Uh, I think people should you should talk. Get over any shyness and talk to everybody that you meet and you'll end up meeting some super interesting people. Some of them will refuse to talk to you and look at you like you're crazy. Some will talk to you and you'll have a nice little conversation for two minutes and one out of every hundred will end up being your friend. Yeah, I think that's great. I think to add to that, there, I'm sure you've read the book Here is New York. Uh, no, I, I teach that book great. to my class. Amazing book. It's by E.B. White. He talks about New York, but he talks about how a lot of people who come and move to New York too have a misconception about what a neighborhood is supposed to be like. And in New York, your neighborhood isn't, isn't like square miles, it's like three blocks. You, you talk to your laundromat person, you talk to your bodega guy or girl, you, you get to know everybody in your neighborhood and that's what puts the roots down for you. That's what makes this city tolerable. That's what makes you able to weather the storms, to weather the depression, the brutality of the city, the competition of the city, is this community that you have to establish for yourself and it's only done that way. Well, let me just add an additional plug for yeah. E.B. White's Here is New York. First yeah. of all, it's not even really a book. I mean, it's so no, it's a book. Essay. It's, it's like a 48-page yeah. essay. You could read it in like half an hour. Yeah. And it was written in something like 1948 or 52 or something like that. And you would think, if they just change a little bit of the language, um, that it could be written today. Yeah, it's, it's written exactly today. Yeah, yeah. the same city yeah. that he was describing then. And when you read, that, that's probably the time that I realized, wow, cities really don't change that much. No. And, uh, and it's it amazing. is a brilliant yeah. essay. Yeah, and he even mentions certain things like the cliche, what back then even, was still, I could visit, but I could never live there. Yeah. And that's what he was addressing when he said, you gotta meet people, you gotta make a community for yourself, and that's what makes it, it not only makes it tolerable, but makes it fun. You know, you weather, you weather the storm when you first move here with people, you grow with people, and you meet people who then put you on a path to do whatever you never know you don't even have to buy it it's just just do here is new york here's PDF new york F on google it'll L come right out listen do yourself a favor if you haven't read that read it that's the one thing you gotta take away but i i guess our time is up seth i really appreciate you uh coming and and, and uh, hanging out um it, it was great great hanging out the last question here's the last question very important question um will you be my friend <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a very uncomfortable to put me in this situation, but the easy thing is, it's like when, you know, um, I shouldn't say this, but it's like when if a woman says, I love you, you got to say, I love you back, right? You don't have any choice. So yes, I'll be your friend. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, that's great. Celebration. And, uh, you know, I'm no love expert, but if a woman ever tells you I love you, don't give that previous part before saying I love you back. <laughs>
All right, well, uh, thanks again, Seth. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'll take that. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys, give it up for Seth. All right.